So um, as Clarice, um, no, um, as Andrea already said, um, I will be talking for a little while at the beginning. I'll be trying to keep things relatively short um, and I'll just focus on sort of some key aspects from my perspective that really were important um, in preparing this proposal. But obviously I want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, yeah, it's sometimes difficult to anticipate sort of what you might be most interested in. So as you can see here, I'll be focusing on the key steps in the application process. I'll also be talking about some of the challenges that we've already experienced and also anticipated future challenges. And um, yeah, then we can hopefully have a nice discussion about this. So as a bit of background information on this, um, the project really builds on a previous REF impact case study from the um, REF 2021. So there was a, an impact case study on extending return to protection and um, reproductive rights at work in the global south. So there were really two core streams of work embedded in this. So one was focusing on maternity protection at work and the other one on sexual and reproductive health rights at work. So I'd been doing quite a lot of work on maternity protection, also in the context of SMEs, I knew, but not sort of review work and work in, um, in Ghana and in Malaysia and in South Africa, but I'd not actually done any work on this in the UK. I knew that there was a huge gap in knowledge um, in, in relation to the SME context. Um, and then, yeah, all of a sudden there was this funding opportunity and I'll show you a little bit more about this in a moment. So yeah, we were successful in winning this grant for your project, ESRC funded, and uh, the proposal was initiated by members of the Gender and Diversity Research Cluster. And well, in, in order to sort of set this up a little bit more, I think it was really important for winning this money that we knew not only that there was this gap in knowledge, but also a real need. It was very timely to have this project as it feeds into current recent UK policy debates. And we knew it really helped to make this point um, how timely and current you know this project would be. Because we, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this as we go along as well. Um, as part of the project team, we have two core charities involved as um, uh, co-investigators who are really key actors in the field in the UK. So they are really up to date in terms of current policy debates, also informing current policy debates, doing their support work, advocacy work. So it really helped us to make this point about um, the timeliness of the project. And uh, so then we also really... So I'll be showing, um, showed that, you know, the project was really set up to have direct impact on practice and policy. And I think it really helped me that I'd just gone through the experience of preparing this impact case study for the REF, um, where it was constantly about impact and, you know, chasing up letters of, letters of support. So almost when designing the study, I was going backwards. It's like, okay, what is the impact that I would ideally like to achieve with this project? And then try to already embed this in the, the entire sort of research project process. So that was the call. Um, and we see it's a bit of a chicken and egg question. Sometimes you might have a research question. Um, to begin with, you have an idea for a project and you're just trying to find the right, you know, um, funding opportunity for the project. Um, and sometimes, you know, you just identify a, a funding opportunity and then it's about, okay, um, how could I best use this, sort of, you know, looking at my sort of key research interests, what's the best um, possible project that I could actually prepare a proposal for. So here, obviously, it was a bit of both. I remember that quite a few people sent this funding opportunity to me, uh, opportunity to me at the time, and immediately I thought, yeah, okay, I can do something on return to protection, probably in, in the context of SMEs, as this is really then what makes it stand out, what makes it different, you know, and it's building on, on previous work in the UK. So um, a key question for me then also was, hmm, okay, I had not actually prepared a proposal um, 
of the size before I started work on one, was, which was pretty much close, yeah, ready for submission, but then it wasn't submitted in the end. And so, yeah, it's like if I'd led on, on other research projects up to maybe 50K, um, and I'd also led on work streams on larger projects, but this really was new to me. And then obviously you need to find ways of, of selling this as well um, to the funder that you are actually qualified to lead a project of this size. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a moment as well. So that's just a brief overview of our project team. So within Middlesex, it's mostly colleagues um, from LO, MLO, then it's myself from CEDA, and then we also have two people from the economist de uh, economics department um, who will be leading on the quantitative work stream. Then we have a couple of um, colleagues from other universities. And I'd already mentioned that we've got these two charities on board um, that really make you know, the, the project very practice and policy focused as well. So. Yeah, before we move on, I know that, you know, you might not necessarily be interested in the research um, topic, but I think it's important for setting up, you know, how we actually identified this um, uh, gap in research. And also, I think it's always quite challenging to, to pose the right question, also to identify, like, you know, if you... You, you saw previously, okay, you know, you needed to have at least a proposal for 535,000 pounds. So, you know, you need to have an idea for a project that can be as big as that. And, you know, like what, what would you actually include in a project for that amount of money? So it's this, you know, value for money question. So, um, yeah, our focus on, on SMEs, um, we basically said, well, the transition to parenthood is one of the most impactful processes in a person's working life course. Um, but that, and there's a lot of work on this out there. There's a lot of research on this topic, but most of it focuses on pregnancy and parenthood and employment in large firms. And the argument here was that this is surprising given that SMEs account for 99.9% .9 of the business population. And we also said, right, okay, um, why isn't it just possible to use whatever guidance is out there, out there for large um, workplaces? Well, we said, well, small, medium-sized enterprises are actually very different from large firms as they very often don't even have a dedicated human resource department, very often no written maternity or paternity policies. They tend to have more for informal approaches to staff management. And well, resource scarcity is a key characteristic. I mean, everything really is always around time and costs involved in whatever it is that they do. So really, um, if you have, you know, maybe a toolkit or guidance for employers that is 120 pages long, it's very unlikely that a small employer would actually have a look at this. And also if, you know, immediately, if you want to look up, you know, information on how to support a member of staff. And the first thing you read is, well, your something about your HR department, it will immediately mean for these employers or employees, okay, this is not really about me. And this is something that we wanted to address with this project. As I already said, we are building on previous work in the UK. So there is, has been work on um, supports of mothers and pregnant workers um, in the UK context. Um, but then, and it also identified that small employers had the lowest awareness of the rights of pregnant and newly maternal um, employees, but there were no specific recommendations for SMEs as part of this study, and it also did not include fathers. So we really saw this urgent need for this context uh, sensitive support. What they also did, I mean, I already mentioned, you know, if you have a very long document or a lot of information on a website, it's very unlikely that a small firm will actually look at this. So we are really planning to, to develop bite-sized information that's very much tailored to the needs of small workplaces. So in terms of the scope, I already said it's a UK project, um, but it also addresses a global problem because SMEs are globally under-researched, although they employ the majority of workers worldwide. And I think that was also an important 
point that we could make here um, to sell this to the funder. And we help to be able to demonstrate this, you know, that it's a, a global interest that we're actually addressing here, um, because we've got the International Labour Organization um, on board as part of our advisory board as well. In terms of the methodology, it's a mixed methods design. So we've got two large scale surveys, which I thought was important so that we actually have the numbers, the hard evidence, um, you know, that doesn't currently exist, the database on small firms. Um, but then an important element of our impact strategy is also that we have longitudinal qualitative elements where we conduct interviews with um, both employers and employees over the period of the whole year. So already there, we in theory should have some very valuable impact of change for each of these participants, you know, as we go along, so their own experiences. Yeah, and I'll be saying a little bit more about the multiple stakeholder participatory approach in a moment. Yeah, first I want to talk about putting together a research team as well, because I think that's also, it really needs to be done very strategically, something you wouldn't necessarily think, you know, you wouldn't necessarily give this that much thought, um, but it actually is a vital component of getting it right. I already said that I personally, I you know, been involved in, in a lot of research projects because uh, I do, you know, work for a research center rather than work as a lecturer. So I've been doing a lot of research, but I've not led a project of this size before. So I needed to make sure that I had people on the team and advisory roles who did have this experience. And at the same time, you know, also have even more junior um uh, team members involved so that I really, you know, I really tried to make sure that I was including early career, mid-career, senior um, researchers along the board. Um, I was not allowed to um, write in a PhD studentship, for example, but we now do have a um, post, uh, postdoc um, research fellow. So, yeah, so that's something that I think we addressed quite well. It was also about looking at transdisciplinary, a transdisciplinary team. Um, so that's something that's required everywhere these days. And it's actually quite a challenge. It was a real challenge um, to, to work also with the um, uh, colleagues from um, economics, because sometimes it was really, you know, when it was about sample sizes, I think, you know, sometimes we didn't quite understand each other. You know, one was asking for, you know, too many um, interviews on the qualitative side. And I was like, well, the quantitative side, you, that, this is insane. It's like, no, we need that many. Otherwise, we can't run these trials. And da, da, da. So it was like, it was a real challenge. Um, um, but I think we we made it work in the end. Um, and it was, it's also important that I think it helps you if you're being challenged and your methodology as you go along and you have to to negotiate with you know other team members this is really valuable in itself and really helps you to strengthen your proposal and then I mean you can see here we we have people from you know a range of disciplines involved and it was always about making sure that all these different perspectives and interests you know, in the topic are being reflected in what it is that we're proposing to do. And then the experience of working in partnership with policymakers and our practitioners. And I, at CEDA, I've been doing quite a lot of that as well, and others in the team as well. I mean, like um, the professor from Manchester, Emma Bannister, she was actually, while we were pre um, preparing the proposal, working on another study with Working Families, one of the charities. And um, Helen Norman, she had just won an ESRC grant as well, and she was working with the Fatherhood Institute. So they had this experience as well of, you know, being very practice oriented research as well. And I think that that was a real asset. Yeah, so um, said the project team is an important element of our impact um, strategy. So not only in terms of um, the researchers, but I said also um, the policy thinkers support providers. So the fact that we had those practice based co-investigators, but it was not just about 
their work itself and having them on board, but also all of the networks that we sort of bought with them. Um, I think um, that really had this multiplying effect in terms of being able to reach out, also to in terms of recruiting um, participants for the study and reaching out to policymakers, um, and then also their academic networks um, that we could then you know tap into. So, really, I think it was it was really good stuff. And I think only along the way it became clear actually how valuable it was to have them on board. And then we also have our advisory board members. So also all really key organizations with an interest in this field and you know going from sort of more small local organizations to the global organization um uh, the international labor organization also i said that we were building we are building on pre previous research in the field so the study that i mentioned that was um uh run by the then um government department biz in collaboration with the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And I also think the fact that they then said, well, we are happy to be on the advisory board. This is an important study that really backed up the need for this research. So in terms of the outputs that we said um, we would develop as part of this um, project, we have a lot impact focused outputs and I think that's very important I was already talking about the bite-sized information rather than just um you know a hundred page report that some you know user groups beneficiaries of the research would just not touch um so as you can see here we've got um sort of short toolkits related videos and really we are planning to make sure that a really um yeah, of interest to two different user groups and having the, 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 you know, possible beneficiaries on board as part of our project team and the advisory board itself, you know, having them co-designed with all the different people who are involved in the project group, hopefully really make sure that they're as targeted and, and needs-based as possible. But of course, because it's research council funding, you can't just focus on um, the impact focused outputs. It's going to be wonderful for the ref, I'm pretty sure, but we also need the academic outputs. And so they are obviously included um, as well. So we have the standard report as well. We, we will have a one day academic workshop. Obviously, there will be the data sets that we will need to make available and then hopefully also the academic papers. And yeah, the key issues and challenges, obviously it's wonderful that we've won this grant. At the same time, it's always slightly daunting, you know, as you're celebrating the, the success and uh, you're already thinking, oh my gosh, now I need, now we need to deliver. <laughs> um, and I think one of the key reasons, I think people have been aware before that there is a gap with respect to small employers and small employees in the field. But the reason why people have probably not touched this or maybe tried to touch it and given up is that they're just really hard to convince that it's a great idea to, to participate in research because, especially on the employer side, because of resource scarcity. So it's quite difficult to get them on board for something, especially if you are telling them hi it's something that'll go on over a period of a year so we would want to speak to you several times um over the period of a year so it is a worry but we're hoping that since we have the support organizations on board that we can go through their networks as well through their member organizations so the, you know member organizations of for example working families um we have all sorts of networks that we can tap into through our um, advisory board members as well. And I think it's also important if you, obviously we, we will need to be uh, aware of, you know, potential bias here. And it, obviously we don't only want to get those employers on board who are the more support at the more supportive end or the ones that really had very extreme negative experiences. It's something it, obviously you would like to get experience from across the board and I think we'll achieve this by having this really broad spread of you know different organizations we can go through um so hopefully 
um, we will get a good spread of um, experiences and not just the ones at extreme ends of the spectrum. Um, yeah, and then obviously it's a concern that, uh, well, it will be quite, even if you want to, you know, produce bite-sized information, but you want to reach everybody like, mm, well, it's going to be difficult to to have a recipe for success. You know, it's this, well, there probably is no one size fits all solution. Um, and then obviously there, you know, if you look at diversity, different groups, if it's, if you're looking at, as it says here, um, things like skill level, ethnicity. So it, it will be very complex, you know, and um, yeah, getting things right at the the end in terms of um the outputs will be a key challenge but then i suppose it, it's going to be a process it's i think comparable to preparing the the proposal itself um it's you know it's it's something that takes time and it, it really required i don't know how many rounds of rewriting and i suppose uh, you know with this you know some things will probably naturally fall into place as we are going along i hope you know as long as you try to think of as many aspects as possible and, and say right okay we, we we'll try to take this into into account we'll try to take that into account there's only so much you can do yeah and and maybe one more thing about writing the proposal i said you know there were all these iterations you know preparing the proposal I think it was um, announced in the funding opportunity was announced in May last year. And we pretty much started our work straight away, also because I knew that people would be away at different times over the summer. And it's just such a time consuming, tedious process. Um, it's nothing that you can rush. So if something at this scale, it really takes time and lots of rounds of polishing and it's already, you know, a process that can be full of frustration if you don't get, you know, hear back from people, you know, you need to chase things up, everything takes time. And then obviously you've got the whole administration behind it, you are dependent on many people. So you really need to plan ahead and you need to be very organized with this. So just as a sign of warning. And yeah, so um, it meant that we also after, um, submitting the proposal of course we at some stage received um comments from the reviewers that we needed to respond to and then it was quiet again for some time but then um yeah at some stage we got the good news um and as um Andrea already said seven projects are now funded under the program out of 74 and here on this slide I um, included some of the links so that you can actually see what the other um, projects are that are funded under the call. Um, then there is um, the Middlesex Press release and also the pro um, UKRI project announcement. And yeah, and that's it from me really. And any questions, I'll see what I can do about answering them. I'll do what I can.